Welcome back to the story of Liberty. This is John Bona. The best courtroom lawyer in his time, he became a, an American congressman, a U.S. Senator and Secretary of State during the period leading up to the Civil War. He took part in several Supreme Court cases and as Secretary of State established the eastern border between the United States and Canada. He was born in 1782 in New Hampshire. He grew up on a small farm with his nine brothers and sisters. He went on to Dartmouth College and became a lawyer in 1805. He became interested in politics and gave a speech in Washington one day that proved critical to his career. He was also the leading constitutional scholar of his time. The great orator he was, it was said that he was the finest speaker on this side of the Atlantic, Daniel Webster. Daniel Webster had even impressed the renowned Scottish historian Thomas Carlyle, who wrote, Not many days ago I saw at breakfast the noblest of your nobles, Daniel Webster. He spoke one day at the bicentennial celebration of the founding of the Pilgrims in Plymouth, Massachusetts. It was on December 22, 1980, and here's what he said. He said, Let us not forget the religious character of our origin. Our fathers were brought hither by their veneration of the Christian religion. They journeyed by its light. They labored in its hope. They sought to incorporate the principles with the element of their society and to diffuse its influence through all their institutions. In the full conviction that this is the happiest society which partakes in the highest degree of the mind and peaceful of Christianity. Webster was always ready and determined when he spoke. When addressing the president, he said, Mr. President, I wish to speak today not as a Massachusetts man, not as a northern man, but as an American. I speak today for the preservation of the Union. Hear me for my cause. The voice grew stronger and he spoke for three hours without ever looking at his notes. He was brilliant. First, he talked about the history of slavery from an economic perspective. He knew he would lose his audience if he addressed slavery from a moral perspective. He was addressing the senators of the United States from both the North and South. He pointed out that at the beginning of the century, the South had been actually more critical of slavery than the North. After the North found it unprofitable, they started demoting it. When the South started profiting from it, they began to defend it. But the line was drawn in the sand, and the land south of 36 degrees 30 was slave, and all the land north was free. That was the Missouri Compromise. He told the Southern Senators, and he repeated the objections that instead of slavery being regarded as evil, it is now regarded as an institution to be cherished and preserved and extended. He then turned to the northern senators and said, Why wound the pride of the southerners by a wanton denial of equal privileges, derogatory to their character and their rights? He was looking for a peaceful solution in a seemingly impossible situation. It was becoming impossible because there were too many social, economic, cultural, and domestic ties. And unfortunately, civil war could be the only result. He ended by saying, Never did there dissolve on any generation of men higher trust than now dissolve upon us for the preservation of the Constitution and the harmony and peace of all who are destined to live under it. I fully believe to grapple the people of all the states, north and south, to this Constitution for ages to come. 
well, the tremendous ovation from both North and South was expressing hope for the future of America. It was said that Daniel Webster had risen to the highest level of statesmanship one can achieve. But he always had one ambition in mind, to remind the people that they were Americans first. Webster said, our ancestors established their system of government on morality and religious sentiment. When asked what the greatest thought that ever passed through his mind, he said, my accountability to God. It was just a few hours before his death and he said slowly and very thoughtfully, the great mystery is Jesus Christ, the gospel. What would the condition of any of us be if we had not the hope of immortality? Thank God the gospel of Jesus Christ brought life and immortality to light, rescued it, and brought it to the light. In his last words, he said, I still live.